Good morning. I'm honored to introduce a member, a leader of the Green Fellowship. Lou is a chemical engineer at the University of Iowa, and you can't bring up his name in the College of Engineering without bringing up a smile on the basis of, of people who know and love him. He brings to us a great passion. Besides the other thing, besides being uh, an international company president, he does travel all over the countryside. He is a professor, but he's a farmer. He's an entrepreneur, uh, an inventor, a friend of mine. Uh, don't hold that against me. And Lou and his wife live up on the ridge above the Iowa River, north of town, in a beautiful spot. Enjoy listening to what Lou has to say to us today. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Great. before I speak. <laughs> but anyway, oh, is there a clicker here to, you're the guy? Okay. Well, most of this is true. So, uh, yes, my name is Lou Lick. I've been a long time, I was a long time member here. Not right now, but that may change. Anyway, um, I've just been the luckiest farm kid. I grew up in Cedar County, far in Loudoun, Iowa. I, uh, I'm one of two engineers in the engineering college that actually owns a farm. So we actually have a, and I have a point of view. I farm on halves, so I re reap the results of good growth and bad growth. And uh, how things happen, fateful. 40 years ago, I was introduced to the poplar tree. Uh, next slide. And, uh, and this is how poplar trees paid for my kids' education. And, uh, and frankly, if you haven't nearly declared bankruptcy twice in your life, you haven't lived. Next? Okay. So, I was in Corvallis at Oregon State for 10 years, and if any of you know the name, Marcus Borg, maybe some of you know the name, a big name in, in, uh, in um, uh, theology, was my Sunday school teacher for 11 years, and one year he talked about how to write a journal. And it's like, how you know, your world is just whizzing around you. He said, I shut the door Sunday night, write the date, the location, and Lord, not my will, but thine be done, and let it flow. And that's what you're getting from me today. Next. So uh, this is the cover of the Rolling Stone, except it's Ag Engineering, February 1990. This is planting the first trees with Jerry Schnorr, you know his name. Jerry and I, uh, I came here with this idea that I wanted to chase it. If I was gonna get a PhD, I was late in life, and it's what I wanted to chase, and, and things turned out. But this was planning at Amana, Iowa, back in 1988. And this is what launched it all, okay. So I have a headquarters, uh, Perry mentioned I have a place out along the res, it's nice, next. And I have a 112 acre corn and soybean farm, and also a tree nursery located on this, next. So, Poplar and willow, people have an instant attitude about poplar. It seems like it's like a bad attitude. And it's often because in the last Dust Bowl era, they gave out uh, buffers, tree buffers, and they were Lombardi poplar, which unfortunately got a virus called septoria canker, and a lot of them fell apart after about 20 years. Even though there are cottonwoods growing at the entrance to our, our uh, our association that are over 100 years old, four feet diameter. So it isn't that they all live and die short, and I'm taking advantage. But they have one trait, one trait in the whole tree kingdom that's unusual, and that is under the bark of the stems, there's baby root initials. So uh, let me just grab a tree. So about every two inches, there's about three roots, 
and when you stick this in the ground, when you stick this in the ground, it puts out roots from the entire buried depth. So though I'm a farm kid, I, I kind of accidentally got a chemical engineering degree, and the bottom line is for a reactor, accumulation equals in minus out plus or minus reactions. That's just no magic, you know, there's no magic. There's no magic with trees, there's no magic. And what my goal was to, to show that I could make a predictable root reactor. In other words, if in this room, in fact, I have a project about the size of this room, X, Y, that I could make a depth, a Z, I could make a volume with predictable properties, and that those properties accomplish what the EPA law requires. And now it's in game for trying to be a solution to some of the problems and they are immense and they are global and we've got to get on it and we need to reset. And this is a 19 month old tree root. It's basically about twice this size, stuck in the ground seven feet. All these roots grew in 19 months. And the limit to growth, all things being equal, fertilizer, heat, soil, etc. The limit to growth is root surface area and I can get a lot of root surface area. And therefore, you've got a good shot and maybe this growing pretty quickly. Next. A lot of genetic material. They've been growing poplar all over the world for, for millennia. Lots of growing, a lot of material so I can choose. I don't have to invent this. That's already there. I have to pick one, but I have to, next. And on this root, root surface, photosynthesis makes sugars and proteins down the phloem, down in the ground, just like below your belly buttons, down in the ground, exudes sugars and proteins, grows new roots, exudes sugars and proteins, and they are the lunch counter and the hotel for microbes. So now you get fast growth, you get a lot of sugars and proteins, you get a lot of microbial activity, so your pollutant is a secondary metabolism. You just don't need, uh, this compared to what I'm growing here, it just overwhelms a pollutant, okay? Lots of research. The University of Iowa, thanks to Jerry Schnorr and some of his colleagues, are number one in the world of how much peer-reviewed literature has been printed on this topic. We're doing continuing more. Next. And we put a lot of, we put trees on all kinds of places. Just trust it. Next. <laughs> This was uh, 19, this is close to 1922, but you can see where a lot of my work is. I, I have trees in Slovenia, um, and I work with people in France, but this is kind of where I work. I lived for 10 wonderful years in the Pacific Northwest. I try and keep that rolling, and then the rest is, is in Iowa, Illinois, and Wisconsin, etc. cetera. Go ahead. And one final thing of trees. You can clean up the pollutants and co-task it and actually grow a cash crop. And after, will, after oak, poplar is the most sold tree in uh, Menards. A lot of reasons. Okay, next. So here's the big idea, the thickness of your little finger. Every drop of water has to pass within the thickness of your finger before it goes away. It isn't very difficult, not nuclear science, okay? So this was the very first project we did. Ended on Earth Day 1990, it got in the newspaper because they needed an Earth Day article. We planted a third, this is an Ill illegal cover. I will tell you right now, the owner wanted a tree cover, didn't want to wrap the place in plastic, and so I got hired to do this and uh, almost got ripped out but now it isn't, and it's actually a permitted site in Oregon. Next. This was uh, last summer. This is a landfill cover in uh, Hanover Park, Illinois, on the west side, the west suburbs, 15 acres. We'll talk a little more about that, okay? And this is what it looks like. That was planted in 1918, I mean 2018. So that's the kind of growth that I expect from the trees. Next. Wow. Uh, this is industrial sites. Sometimes you see them, sometimes they don't. This was uh, uh, Alliant Energy, Wisconsin Electric back in the day, uh, manufactured gas plant. 
That's where they took coal before electricity and they made the gas light districts. And that was the very first light that we had in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And although it looks pretty nice, next, when you dug into it, it's full of pipes and it's got all this stuff, coal tar. You can see the sheen on the groundwater. And um, uh, it's, it's, this is what we dealt with, okay, in 2007. We planted trees, roots eight feet deep, and here it is the next year, they're just starting up, go ahead. And this is what it looked like last year, two years ago. And um, uh, what we're doing, go ahead. What we're doing is pumping the groundwater that's got way more benzene in it. Benzene is a regulated carcinogen and it's a, it's a thousand times the legal drinking standard. And we're pumping it from the ground. You can see some coal tar we catch with filters through, a, through pumps, good. And we drip irrigate it in a <coughs> sub-buried drip tube under the ground between the tree rows, and it's gone. We do this in the summer. They use so much water, it's gone. And the microbes are down there breaking it apart, and the monitoring wells show it's gone too. The benzene, yep. And um, where are we at here? Um, and we plant, we're, this is not inconsequential, 2,000 gallons of water a day. We're pulling from underground, drip irrigating it, and it's gone. And that's, that's been looked on as quite as successful. And I'm going to talk about greed, fear, and fun. The greed is, it's 10% the cost of doing this than digging it and hauling this all away, and they never could get it all anyway. Uh, the, this is appearance. This is what it looks like. There's our trees, and they made a they've made a, a dog park on the parking lots and places like that. Really trying to make beneficial reuse. Else, it was kind of a scab. No one could touch it. Concertina wire around it. It's become an asset of the community. And you can do this. We can do it anywhere, really. Okay. Um, I also treat wastewater. This. These trees, now you see that bag, that bag is uh, four feet tall. Those grew in one year. They were cut off, irrigated with secondary effluent from a sewage treatment plant right there. That's one year's growth. We'll come and talk about that, okay? So, Fager, you mentioned invention. I've got four patents. The last two had involved the Fager, the phytoattached growth <laughs> reactor. You need one of these words that means nothing to anybody. This, this is the Zyrtec of trees, right? And uh, phyto for plant, attached, attached growth, growth, microbes, reactor. So it's kind of a predictable, it has to be predictable to get this working. Next. This is what it is. It's a bag of the stuff sack, they call these, four foot by four foot by four foot, filled with perlite. You know, the fluffy little white rat? Yeah. Uh, seven pounds per cubic foot, it's quite light. Uh, we stick 25 trees in it, just like this, in the ground, this deep, and it roots out the entire buried depth. We'll talk a little more about that, too. Okay. So, when you think about, this is like your coffee pot. It's a dose, dwell time, and discharge. You put water in, it sits there a while, does its thing, Discharge. This is what these tree, trees are like. The reactor is a dose we put water on, dwell, sits there for a while, and inevitably water goes up or it goes down, hopefully treated. Yep. This is one of, I, was, uh, uh, I think, one of my big successes at the moment. Uh, this is, a, there's a half a megawatt of solar power panels there, and the owner had land around it, what to do, what to do. So he put a 49 slot RV park around this and it's fully occupied. This is in Hermiston, Oregon, not far from the Columbia River. And um, every, every, so this is excluded. Every RV has a solar panel and, and um, here's my figure. We'll talk about that next. So, just like in a lot of our our um, rural developments in 
Johnson County and all around, where they don't have a sewage treatment plant to hook up to, they have septic systems. So here, this is the top of the septic system, septic tank that's in the ground 15 feet, it's right deep, and it's a septic tank, and in there, there's one pump, one disc filter, it's a, this mechanical filter, and it goes to drip irrigation. So here we go, next. So these are the Fager bags. We have 48 of them, each stuck with 24 trees. This was in um, uh, 18, it was by June of, of uh, 2018. And here we are, we've cut these off, and here we are, we're making this Fager unit. Okay, this place is full of basalt rock. It's all volcanic in the neighbor, neighbor. So we have a 30 foot deep layer of basalt rock division, so there's two zones, and on top of that, we set those Fager bags on one end. Go ahead. So, uh, this is 75 feet. So, this room is about 75 feet, and it's a little wider than my unit. So, this is what we're talking about now, the size. So, here sits these bags on this bed of basalt rock. There's reasons for basalt. And the water goes through, and it seeps to the drain, and it seeps through roots that are rooting in the basalt rock. So these are in bags, and this is in, in the basalt rock rooted. Next. In this zone, um, uh, sugars and proteins from photosynthesis put, put uh, grows roots, as sugars and proteins, and here's where we uh, get rid of nitrate, which is the a very difficult chemical to treat, which is why we have nitrate in all our waters, why they're in the tile lines, and this is a nitrate treatment system. Okay, next. So here we are installing the basalt rock, and here's the trees. You can see some perlite there, but these are the trees, and we're sticking them in. We're sticking them subsurface, and, um, and uh, so that the water has to go past the root zone. Here, Here's the bags, and the water will seep subsurface in through the roots. Next. And this is what it looks like. We've got them in there. We're starting to water it. Uh, we're filling it up. And uh, it, is, it took us one day to put this thing together. We had the parts and pieces there, but it took us one day to assemble it. So it was pretty quick. Next. And here's what they look like, like a year later. And I'm putting wastewater that's come from the septic tank uh, through sprinklers and into each bag. Next. And this is what it looks like, you know, when they grow back. And I think, what is this? Uh, probably uh, June. And here, these trees were cut off and now they're all starting to grow. Next. And this is what it looks like. What is it? August? Maybe. But these are the trees growing out of the bags now. And over here are the trees in the basin. Next. And uh, so you can cut them off every year so they don't get out of control, and every year this happens. Next. And this is the same shot. This is what it looks like quick. But the point is this. You can do this. This is not that hard. But yet it's not very well accepted by civil engineers who are botanically challenged. I love <laughs> Okay, so... Uh, uh, compared to all the other water treatment systems, the, um, uh, this is different. It's different because you put in water, almost 10, almost a million gallons, and we had less than half come out. The rest of it went through the stomates, went back to the atmosphere as, as vapor. Uh, interesting, here's nitrogen, 1,200 pounds in, um, about, 150 pounds out on a little area, not very big. Uh, settleable solids, oh boy. BOD, that's the organic matter. It took two tons in and it, and it took almost two tons out. So what happens is that it goes through those bags of perlite with tree roots, the microbial activity is zooming, and a lot of it's taken up by those trees, or it's, the ammonia is converted to nitrate, goes through, goes through the basin, 
goes in contact with the trees and, it, and the nitrate is gone too. So bottom line, it's using the organic matter like the law requires. And it's using the nitrogen like the law requires. It's getting out the sellable solids like the law requires. And it's eating and it's even uh, getting rid of microbes, pathogens, okay? Next. And it is a net zero system. There is enough energy produced by the solar panels that it operates all the RVs, the pump, and the wastewater treatment system. And normally these wastewater treatments are energy hogs. When you see and go by a lagoon, not that you do that, but if you look at, at all these lagoons, there they have aerators. And the aerators, they're about 15 horsepower aerators. So a good number to remember is that a motor, a 10 horsepower motor, running all day, 24-7, 365, uses the amount of energy to drive a Prius around the world eight times. And you don't even see it, and it really doesn't help your economic development. Align Energy likes it, but for the town, it's just dead in water, just dead in money. So we're trying to offer an alternative to this, and frankly, things are starting to be of interest by the regulators, but it uses 96% less energy than the alternatives that are normally used by the civil engineers. Okay, and it has a negative carbon footprint because not only do you use less energy, but you're fixing all this carbon into the form of biomass, which you can take off. So it's got a, so here's this thing. The new engineering, the modern engineering for the decade by all these engineers has to make one of the criteria for success reversing climate change. It can't just pollute less and delay it. We have to reverse it. And there is a general belief, I do think, by young people, they're, they're going to face it. So there's some interest in that approach. Next. This, these are figures, except these are Rain barrels planted with trees, these are used by Jerry Schnorr and myself. We're treating a chemical called dioxane. Dioxane leaks out the bottom of burn pits. That um, we hear of burn pits a lot of places. Well, this is from the Army Ammunition Plant just north of St. Paul. The dioxane is denser than water went down to the aquifer, moved 2.6 miles, and has contaminated two drinking water sources for two communities. And so we have a mic, I don't have a microbe. The university is working with a microbe. A doctoral thesis has already been written where they can remove the dioxane by that root system. And so these are going to be moved up to, uh, up to uh, Minnesota. So anyway, next. Also, a lot of these leaks are under, under buildings. I mean, this is, if you had solvents in the buildings, so this plant used to make roof coatings, and they had 21 different solvents, and they accidentally wow. leaked them, and now they're flowing to the Green River, which is right next door, and, and not a good thing. So it would have cost approaching 10 million bucks to get this pumped and treated in a chemical treatment system. You know, it, it would have, uh, we won't get the chemistry, but bottom line is, in alternative, we took this piece of asphalt out and we planted 500 trees. So we strike, we, we located where we want to do this. Next. And here we are. Those are trees from, I have a tree nursery on Whidbey Island. Those are my trees. We removed the, the slab, and now we uh, uh, incorporated biosolids, and we're augering trees, and now we're planting trees. Quite densely, I'll add. Go ahead. And this is what it looked like, what? A little, uh, this was um, May, so we planted in April. This was 40 months later. The trees were 40 feet tall, huh. and we put 21 different solvents, we put groundwater pulled from underneath that, that uh, building, and uh, we drip irrigate it into these trees, and for the bulk of the summer, it's gone. 
because it can transpire a lot of water. It can transpire about a layer of water three quarters of an inch thick every day. I mean, you can get rid of 2,000 gallons a day on this little chunk. Okay? So this is what the root system looks like. We planted it deep. It's, it's zipping out. There's a willow. Those are planted in between the rows. And not to get bogged down in uh, grass because it's just not a good thing to do, that here is March and 40, we can measure the soil moisture below the surface. So here is March and here is June. So this is when photosynthesis starts coming on. And this is 48 inches in the ground. And uh, it's, uh, uh, we won't get in the numbers, but 60 and it goes down to 38 in three months. That water went up while we're irrigating their water. So I mean, this is, a, this is good news. And we did get a permit for this. Next. And just to give you a sense, if you uh, have these Fager bags, we put this groundwater in. Well, this, just, just know, don't have to worry about the chemicals that are in there. Vinyl chloride, um, vinyl chloride was in that uh, tanker that, that uh, uh, happened in Ohio, remember? Yeah. Okay, uh, not long ago. Uh, this is uh, a drug, yeah, okay, it is. Into the bags, out the bags, and this is three-year-old roots, bags with three-year-old roots, brand new bags planted in dirt, and then this was bags planted, these were just planted brand new. So no matter what, age matters, this is one-year-old, this is three-year-old, and the soil itself has a lot of abilities to pull these out and the trees help. Okay. I did get a patent, that's a good thing. <laughs> and and uh, so this is, um, this is uh, uh, the view from where we stay when we're on Whidbey Island. But um, uh, I think the point that I want to make, and we can talk about Iowa and those, the situation we have here, but is that no one was looking here. In the EPA rules, in the civil and environmental world, before we started it, no one was looking here. No one was trying to make these kinds of natural systems achieve uh, rules that are getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And there's new chemicals coming out every year. 20,000 organic chemicals are used in industry, and almost none of them have the toxicology understood. So this is a reality we live in. You think PFAS and PFAS is bad. This isn't as bad as other things, PCBs. And, and we have spent 30 years all in trying to make this commercially viable, but really functionally viable. And there's a lot of people that really don't want this to work because it kind of gores their ox. So, um, but frankly, I would say it's it's working. Uh, it's it's working. You can see the data, and um, and uh, so that's what I wanted to share with the slides. Um, and I think we won't go to other pictures because it just kind of muddles stuff. But um, uh, I will say that I was here when all this started. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in grad school here when we didn't know if there'd be any difference. And Jerry Schnorr, he says he didn't, but he did, say that, uh, well, if there's no improvement in the groundwater, I don't know if you can get a PhD, which was one of the worst nights of my life thinking after. And uh, because we didn't know. We hoped it worked, and it did work. And, uh, but then all these installations, you know, I was a lot of weekends I wasn't here because I was chasing it. But I think it does give us this knowledge and the situation we have in Iowa. Man, we have the most fertilized streams in the world. Mm. We have uh, the least federal and public lands in the United States, fractionally. We have a problem with wildlife and things that depend on wild places, pollinators, things like that. Lots of, lots of issues. And, um, and so my doctoral thesis was on tree buffers and 2% of Iowa controls 80% of what hits the stream. 2%. There's a strategic 2%. 
It's not just anywhere, you know, it's at the bottom of hills, it's intercepting different things. Uh, where is it at? Manure production, where it's raised, where it's spread. Uh, tillage agriculture, urban runoff, all those dogs running around, and uh, small water treatment systems. But what we spend is disproportionately on the small water treatment system when it's a lot more effective if we catch it out in the, in, in the ag land. So I've been talking in terms of greed, fear, and fun. And being a farmer and, um, and uh, looking at it from the farmer's point of view, uh, for this to work, you know, whatever you put together, if in fact it's 2%, well, first of all, on the fear side, there's a lot of reasons for fear. My eight-year-old granddaughter wants to plant trees. Not exactly sure why, but you know, I mean, there's alarm even in the young people. What to do, what to do, what to do. So let's go to greed. Enlightened self-interest is maybe a better way to put it, but you know. And, and uh, so my 4,000 farmed acre neighbor he farms 4,000 acres. For this to work, he has to hope he has that 2% two, two on his land. That the benefits that come from this are better than he could do in overproduced beans and corn. And that's where we're after. We're trying to see how is it that we can strategically put plants and co-task these plants. And what would that tasking be that would generate some value? for the landowner who's not putting corn and beans there now. And he's all set up, he or she, but mostly he, are all set up for corn and beans. It's quick to put that in. And they've got ready market. And we're, we're saying something like this, for example, um, um, that you can get value from three places that actually have money. One is pollution treatment. If, if I don't have to spend more money, more inefficiently in the sewage treatment systems, in the sewage treatment plants, these are expensive to run. Lots of chemicals, lots of energy. And, uh, and we can manage that. Second is carbon, carbon sequestration. If you don't want the carbon in the air, and you don't want the carbon in the water, acid, it creates acids, you got to put it, you have to put it in the ground. And so if I could get the value per ton of carbon that the, that the um, CO2 pipeline is paying, 12 million cubic meters, we can talk about this, but if I got paid at that rate, I could get $300 worth of value per acre if we could find a way to get the carbon in and keep it there. This is a big issue. And the other place of value is, um, I've got it here, is harvest. And um, so, so this is the bottom of a 14-year-old tree. And in fact, that red is from microbes. I was surprised myself. But um, if you have like six, 700 of these per acre, what we think you can do, because we've done it, is uh, in Iowa, I think the university even owns gasifiers. Gasifiers, you can ship this up, don't have to dry it, put it in a gasifier. It, it creates carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which then is reburned, and you get good heat, it's clean. Biochar, you may have heard the word biochar. Biochar is the remaining solids particles left of this. And so if the program was strategically found 2%, and Larry Weber, have you had him speak here yet, Larry? Larry is the head of the Flood Center. I mean, cool. Mm -hmm. And a farmer. He's the only other farmer in the engineering school. <laughs> that uh, uh, Larry, I said, Larry, you know, can you, you know where every drop of water is in a rainstorm. Can you find that 2%? He said, I can get, I'll be close. So you can get the most out of co-tasking that 2% to get the most value. And... There's only one rule. There's only one rule in managing that land. It has to have perennial roots. It has to have the ability to not every year start with a seed, like corn, bean, 
you can start with the root system. And remember, the limit to growth is root surface area. I start with a big root surface area. So, so, um, tree to show you. So this tree grew off of, off of a stump and, uh, and there were four of these like this from one stump. And remember this is, this is uh, growing so, so in this 14 year old stump here um, you know, I've got rings here, one inch thick. Poplar grows fast. And actually, there's still quite a, quite a strong wood. Mona Lisa's painted on a slab of poplar, for example. <laughs> and uh, it's a take out of question if, if people say, what good is it? Um, but but um, we need a reset. We can't wait another 20 years. I mean, all the, it's doom and, you know, the, so, so, so what to do? Greed, fear, and fun. Fun is the unfunded. It's the wildlife habitat. It is the pollinator. It is the, it is the uh, mix in this, in this, um, in this uh, perennialness that actually is known to have importance, known to have benefits, known to be a, a, key, a keystone species. And we can do that. So imagine people, okay, so criticism um, uh, that, well, what's the equipment? How are we going to do this? And my answer is 40 years ago, we did not have big round balers. It just is a message to the market, to the John Deere's, the Vermeer's of the world that, hey, and who will be your supporters of this idea? Well, being a farmer, knowing a lot of farmers, grew up on a farm, they hate spending money on LP gas to dry their corn. So you go to Saka, who builds bins and say, you know, put insert a gasifier into your unit so I can be burning my wood on that 2% as far as return on investment. This uh, block of wood, dry matter of probably would be about three pounds. Two and a half of these equal the amount of energy in a gallon of LP gas. And I probably can grow a year. I can probably grow the equivalent of 2,000 gallons of LP gas per acre. Yeah. So it's a different economy. And, and um, but I don't see good ideas coming. I mean, when I look at, at all of these ideas, and there's some really cool ideas and they do bring in extra carbon or whatever. The problem is at scale. We need to do this at scale. We need 600,000 acres of this in Iowa just to crack the surface. Well then, here comes the criticism, or I mean the comment, well, what about that pipeline? Uh, the carbon dioxide pipeline? Well, interestingly, uh, it's got some advantages. You got a nice captured stream of carbon dioxide from, from all that ethanol, and it's about 40% of the carbon, so you're losing 40%, but that's how it is. And, um, and 12 million cubic meters was the very first uh, amount proposed by ADM to take it to uh, Illinois. Let me tell you how much that is. A cubic meter of methane Contains, contains 13 pounds of carbon. It contains the amount of carbon in a 24 pound ham. Okay, just because when you use the word cubic meter, 99% of Iowa kind of left you. I'm sure that you faculty people know that. So, um, but the point is that if you took all 12 million cubic meters, it's the amount of carbon in one unit train of coal and I have an old lumber yard in Loudoun, Iowa. We have 2,000 unit trains of coal passing us a year. So it's a pathetically not big amount for $4.8 billion, a billion dollars. So, so it's like, okay, you're talking it. A lot of people, are, they don't know much about the chemistry. There's a lot of emotion. And, uh, but again, back to the thought is that 
I'm an optimist by nature. You can't be a farmer if you don't have some optimism in you. And uh, of course you're dashed, dashed harshly sometimes too. But that to do it at scale, you have to involve plants at ambient temperature and pressure. The only reaction to reverse carbon is this, really, at scale. And, and really, I, what I see happening is this is starting to buzz. People are starting to talk about it for various reasons. I think people want hope. And there was a lot of young people, boy, not only they want to hope, they want to do something. But I mean, you know, significant. And I don't mean just electric cars. I mean something else they can do. So you know, you could put a buffer here. There's a lot of things around here. You could put a few. Uh, this one tree I have, we could plant that into a pot and they could watch it grow during the growing season here. Just, and I mean, there's some things just to, you know, kind of tickle your mind, especially for young people. But, but um, as you realize that you have to have space, the right plant, and the ability to get it in the ground and take care of it, you get those trees three together, and you don't have to be an old person to do it. This may be the kind of thing that we can find as, as part of your mission, or at least enable the kids to do it. So with that said, questions and whatever you'd like to talk about.